Well, we start a new book, 2 Samuel. And this is the first session. We'll do it in about eight sessions. This is going to deal with David at Hebron. If you recall our timeline from our Learn the Bible in 24 Hours profile, we obviously are moving into that period of the monarchy, uh, Saul, David, Solomon, and following. After Solomon, of course, it'll divide into two kingdoms and and uh, northern kingdom will get wiped out ultimately by the Syrians and the southern kingdom will go into exile to return after 70 years. So we have the historical books. We're going through one by one. We've just gone through 1 Samuel, where we talked about not just Samuel, he's the last of the judges, if you will, but the we went through the career of Saul, who had such promising beginnings and yet such a dismal end. Tough book, important book, basic book, 1 Samuel. But now we get to go into 2 Samuel, which is the, the career of the world's greatest king. Somebody asks you, who's the greatest king that ever lived? Beside Jesus Christ, of course. And the answer, of course, is David. And yet we discover as we try to learn about him how human he is. He makes mistakes. He's a very flesh and blood, real guy. And it's, a, it's going to be, a, Second Samuel will be a lot of fun. So that's what we're into. And uh, we'll get into Chronicles after we get through, when we get through Samuel and the Kings, we'll go, Chronicles recaps that same period from David through the end of, to the Babylon exile with the emphasis on the southern kingdom. Judah. We went through the first book of Samuel, which of course had Samuel's career, Saul's career, and just the beginning of David before he's crowned. His anointing, his service before Saul, and then the years as a fugitive were covered in the first book of Samuel. Second book of Samuel, we're going to see David at Hebron, and here's where all the intrigues start, because he isn't really crowned as king of the nation yet, and yet there's all this positioning. We'll get into that in the first four chapters. The next five chapters will have his time of prosperity as a king. Terrific time. But then he, we encounter his failures. David and Bathsheba, that famous story. Can you imagine that guy having to go through eternity with that rap? Amnon's sin, Absalom's rebellion, the national unrest, and then David's final years. All this will be in the second book of Samuel. So these eight sessions that we'll go through should give us a terrific summary of the greatest king on the planet Earth. So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're going to talk about the Malachite's tale and the song of the bow. What are we talking about? So let's just jump in. Now it came to pass, after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag, it came to pass even on the third day and so on. I might mention, you may recall, the Amalekites uh, attacked Ziklag. When David got found that they'd been rooted, he wiped out the Amalekites freed the women, and even though the uh, cineraries had really uh, uh, burned the town, apparently there was enough left there that David and his 600 could uh, still uh, find some accommodation. It came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head, and so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And so we're going to encounter this Amalekite. As we do, we'll discover that his accounting of the death of Saul is quite different than the one we experienced in the closing chapter of 1 Samuel. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, that the people are fled from the battle and many of the people also are fallen and dead and Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. And David said to the young man that told him, how knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? And the young man that told him said, as I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me. And I answered, Here am I. He said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered, I'm an Amalekite. He said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them hither to my Lord." Now, the uh, crown uh, had a, it's a small metallic cap or wreath, 
which typically encircled the temples, but it, uh, it had a, a, a small horn on it, which was the, the emblem of power. And the bracelet was on his arm. This is a very common thing, strange enough, uh, to wear a, an amulet above the elbow, and uh, as a mark, often an ancient mark of uh, royalty. Anyway, he apparently took both of these from Saul and bringing him uh, to David, thinking he's going to get rewarded. Now, you'll notice it's a very different story than uh, we learned from the inspired account, which was the last chapter of First Samuel. So we've got a, a yarn here sp you know, spun by this guy that's improbable and inconsistent, unlikely for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's unlikely that uh, Saul had been leaning on a spear unattended by Israelite warriors, and uh, especially as the Philistine chariots are, are charging him and, and that they, he happened to call on a stranger passing by. So the whole thing is, is uh, quite inconsistent with the scripture. It's obviously a, a tale that this Amalekite fabricated in hoping to ingratiate himself uh, to the king, assuming that, that knowing that David was the, you know, they were traditional adversaries, he assumed that he'd get rewarded for having you know, killed David's enemy in his mind, at least. And uh, that was a tragic miscalculation because David's a different kind of guy. Remember, David had many chances to kill Saul and never did. Verse 11, so David took hold on his clothes and rent them. And likewise, all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan the son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? He answered, I am the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. That's what he said at the beginning, actually, right? And uh, David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Whoops. This was not the reaction the young man had expected. David's you know, saying, How, Where'd you get the audacity to... Destroy the Lord's anointed. David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. So the Malachite, for the, for the sake of spinning this yarn, gets rewarded by being ended. Now this is useful for several reasons. Obviously, uh, it, it's justified because of the Malachite uh, uh, situation here. But it also would prevent untrue accusations by David's political opponents that they might suggest he had a part directly or indirectly in the death of Saul. Quite the contrary. David had numerous opportunities to slay Saul and didn't. And now when he finds the guy that claims he did, he has him killed. That makes the point, if you follow me. Verse 16, David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. So he accepted his own testimony. So we have uh, an act of honor to the dead king. And also, uh, I'm not suggesting this was David's motive, but it also ha it, it was politically astute because uh, it will silence any criticism from the other tribes, the non-Judah tribes, as we'll see what, of what comes here lately. Anyway, verse 17, David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And what we have now from here to the end of the chapter is sometimes called the Song of the Bow. It's an elegy. Some writers even think that this elegy has became a national war song uh, to be taught to the young uh, Israelites, all under the name of the bow. And so he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. And uh, not just, not just the, the bow in a, in a military sense, but the song itself. Behold, it is written in the, in the book of Jasher. And by the way, the book of Jasher is available or at least something he purports to be it. And uh, it's, it's interesting reading. It's, the, the book of Jasher is, is quoted in uh, Joshua 10, 13 here, and also it's quoted in uh, 1 Kings 8, verse 53, in the Septuagint only, strangely. But anyway, we'll move on here. The beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? That phrase is almost a chorus in what follows. It's going to show up, at, I think, at least three times. How are the mighty fallen? Not just Saul, but also Jonathan. But of course, it's referring to King Saul. It's interesting through this whole, these remarks, there's nothing critical or derogatory about Saul. You think David would have ample reason to do that. He was this, this, this irrational adversary, but he meant, there's no mention of that. 
how the mighty are fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Those are the cities of the Philistines, right? Gath, Ashkelon. Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew. Neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away. The shield of Saul as though he had not been anointed with oil. That's a, a, a double meaning there. And of course, anointing an oil as king, but also that's the way they took care of their shields. They were typically leather-covered wood, and they oiled it to keep it sharp. These are The implication here, it's cast aside. It's, he visualizes it as if it's laying on the mountains, no longer polished, no longer ready to be worn in action, but cast aside, worthless, neglected, and so on. See, what also happened... On that fatal battle at Gilboa, not only did Saul and Jonathan get killed, but um, the uh, Israelite soldiers uh, who uh, uh, had been unfl shown unflinching valor in other battles, they threw away their shields and fled from the field. So it was also a, a, a battle, not only where Saul uh, and, and Jonathan got killed, but also one of dishonor from Israel's point of view. Going on. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. It's interesting. The sword was uh, Saul's weapon. Uh, the, the bow and arrow was uh, Jonathan. Remember, Jonathan even used that as a signal with David. So it's, he apparently was a very skilled archer. Going on, Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet, and other delights, and put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love was to me, was wonderful, passing the love of women. How are the mighty fallen, and the weapons of war perished? So that's the first chapter. You know, a lesser saint would have uh, probably rejoiced that his enemy had finally died. But David was a man after God's own heart. I'm sure David felt very keenly about Saul's sin. There were many. The, the not killing the Amalekites, the Endor situation, all of that. It's tragic that the disobedient father caused the death of his son, Jonathan. In fact, if David had been there, he, probably, he might have been killed too if that had happened. But it's interesting as you hear this whole response from David's heart, there's not a single unkind word about Saul, even hinted anywhere through here. David's whole concern was that the Lord's anointed had been slain. And therefore, in, in a sense, the Lord's glory had been dimmed. And he was also anxious that none of the unsaved rejoice over this victory. Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Saul stood higher than any other man, and now he stands lower than the enemy. Okay, we get into chapter 2. This takes David at Hebron. And now the intrigues begin. You realize the situation. The king is dead. Saul is dead. David is not crowned as king yet. He will be shortly. There's a, a transition in here where people are going to grasp for power. And we're going to see some... Uh, we're going to have a, a number of murders occur in the next few chapters. Uh, the whole era at Hebron is a, is a, a bloody area. The political intrigues, uh, by the way, the political intrigues will plague David throughout his entire life. Even though David continually tries to seek the heart of God that doesn't protect him from the plots and schemes of others, his march to the throne is going to be a difficult one. Let's jump in. Chapter 2, verse 1, it came to pass that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up unto, into any of the cities of Judah? In other words, what do I do now, Lord? The Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And the Lord said, unto Hebron. How did he determine this? Apparently by the Urim and the Thummim. From, uh, we'll find, we'll, uh, in 1 Samuel 23, that was what was used. The word, you hear so much about Hebron in the uh, newspapers today. It's a, a source of a lot of issues. The word actually means brotherhood. There's a group of cities, a federation of cities. It, they're now called El Khalil in the, in the Arabic which is a contraction for the city of the friend of God. It's actually an allusion to Abraham. It served as a center for the league of or confederation of the clans of Judah. And Caleb was associated with them. 
It's about 20 miles south of Jerusalem, to give you a rough orientation here. Now, David knew his destination, and he also knew that God, the promise of God would pave the way to get there. He's asking direction and, and, uh, and follows it. Now, David's going there because God told him to. But it's interesting, uh, it, all his interests there were very powerful draws. He was within his own tribe, the tribe of Judah. Understanding this time of turmoil, that was important. The chiefs of the tribe of Judah were friendly uh, to him. We learned that from 1 Samuel uh, chapter 30. Hebron was the capital and the center of the tribe of Judah. So this all makes sense. It also is one of the Levitical cities. And that's going to play into what's going to come in the coming uh, events here. Now, also, the, the, uh, the people there were attracted to him because partly because of the, uh, the massacre at Nob. Uh, the prospect of realizing uh, in his person their promised preeminence. See, the, the, the tribe of Judah knows that if he's going to be king, that's going to improve their lot too. So he will be in favorable territory here. So David went up thither, and his two wives, also Hinoam the Jezreelites, and Abigail Nabal's uh, wife, the Carmelite. And his men that were with him uh, did David bring up every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of uh, Hebron. And uh, the men of Judah came and they were anointed. There they anointed David king over the house of Judah. This is just under one tribe. There's 11 others, realize. And they told David, saying that the men of Jabesh Gilead were that they buried Saul. Now, David does a very political thing here. He's going to, in verse 5, he sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh Gilead and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have shown this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. Because remember, they at risk to themselves went and brought down the bodies off Beth Shan and buried them. That was, a, that was a heroic thing for them to do. And David here is honoring them with that. Now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you, and I will requite you this kindness because ye have done this thing. The Jabesh Gilead guys were, were very bold and uh, took on a dangerous enterprise, getting the bodies of Saul and the sons. And so David's giving him a personal uh, expression of, of gratitude for that. So... Uh, now, the announcement of his royal power in Judah was also a shrewd move because it accompanies it with a pledge of protection and especially of the men of Jabesh Gilead because uh, they're exposed uh, to danger from Bet to a reaction from Beth Shan for having gotten Saul's body down off the walls. So this was good for both sides, in other words. Therefore, now let your hands be strengthened and be vigilant, for your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. So things are going swimmingly, but now we have some struggles going on. Now emerges this character by the name of Abner, and uh, he is the first cousin of Saul. Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host. So he's the military commander of the dead king's troops. He takes... Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Menahim and made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites and over Jezreel and over Ephraim and over Benjamin and over all Israel. So Abner has got a power play going on here. Ishbosheth is a, um, a sad case. Ishbosheth or Eshbaal, the Hebrews usually change the names, but they ended with Baal to Bosheth, which means shame, by the way. Uh, this prince was so called because he was an imbecile, as you will see. He's, he's, he's just a figurehead that Abner's trying to promote because he's trying to offset David's rise. So he goes on the east side of the Jordan over to Gilead uh, with the Asherites and over Jezreel, which is up in the northern part of the Galilee, and over Ephraim and over Benjamin, over all of Israel. Not Judah, I've got just Israel. So this is actually partly a manifestation of Abner's own ambition try to secure the eastern tribes under the leadership of Ishbosheth. He's He is not only rebelling against David, he's also, in effect, positioning himself against God's word. Because God had made it very clear that David alone was to rule Israel. You can spiritualize this if you like. Many Christians are like that today. They're willing, they're willing to permit the king to only to reign over part of the land, not over their whole lives. And the result of that will be conflict and sorrow. So made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, and over Benjamin. Gilead is a loose phrase for east of the Jordan. Asherites are Asher is the extreme north of the country, and of course Jezreel is that extensive valley by Megiddo. 
Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel and reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. At the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. So this is an era here from Hebron that's uh, going to get complicated. Let's just follow through it. Abner, the son of Ner, the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mananim to Gibeon. It's up there in the north. Now we have Joab, the son of Zeruiah. Now there's another small point here that's very strange. We always find them mentioned by the name of their mother, not their father. There's three guys that are sons of Zariah, who's the mother. The scholars assume that probably the father had passed away, but that's a conjecture. Anyway, Joab, the son of Zariah, and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon, and they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. And that, you understand there's two rival factions here. Joab with the, the supporters of David on the one side, and Abner and his would-be king, uh, Abishith, on the other. And Abner said to Job, Let the young men now arise and play before us. And Job says, Let them arise. Then there arose and went over by number twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And they caught every one his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side, so they fell down together. Therefore that place is called, some unpronounceable name, Helkath Hazurim, which is in Gibeon. By the way, that means the, the field of strong men is what it says. Apparently, this is a, a call to a championship to, to resolve the issue. All it reads is get both sides really inflamed, and, and it starts, in effect, uh, what could be, in a sense, is like a civil war. Abner and his forces were defeated and put to flight in all of this. There was a very sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten, and the men of Israel uh, before the servants of, uh, uh, servants of David. And there were three sons of Zariah, there it is again there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Now Asahel is going to come to the front now. Asahel was as light of foot as a wild roe. In other words, he was a runner. He was a sprinter. He was fast. Asahel pursued after Abner and going, and in going, he turned not to the right nor to the left from following Abner. And Abner looked behind him and said, Art thou Asahel? And he said, I am. Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to thy right hand or to thy left, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. See, I should mention, by the way, see these, these three guys that I mentioned uh, are the sons of Zariah, who is David's half-sister. So they're really David's nephews, if you will. And so they're related as well as being valued men in the army. Now, the idea was, uh, he said, lay hold on one of the young men and take thee his armor. The idea was the general's armor was considered the greatest tr trophy. He's saying, satisfy yourself with a lesser trophy. But Asahel apparently was ambitious to get Abner's trophy or his armor. And uh, he was outrunning everybody and rapidly gaining on the retreating commander. Abner said again to Asahel, Turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab thy brother? In other words, he doesn't want to kill him either because he doesn't want to get that. He knows Joab, the, the commander of their army, is, is, is his brother. Howbeit he refused to turn aside. Wherefore Abner, with the hinder end of the spear, smote him under the fifth rib, that the spear came out behind him. And he fell down there and died in the same place. And it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Asherah fell down and died, he stood still. Uh, so I should, I should probably explain that the, the hinder end of a spear was pointed so it could be stuck in the ground. Was the main, so it's, it, it's not intended to be the, the, the fighting end, but it obviously is sharp and, and, and in this case was effective here. And so it passed through the body. So this impetuous young uh, soldier was uh, deaf to... Uh, uh, Abner's attempt to, you know, the veteran warrior here, to uh, cease. But uh, anyway, it caused his death. So Joab also and Abishai, you know, those two brothers, pursued after Abner. The sun went down when they were come to the hill of Amma that lieth before Gia by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner and became one troop and stood at the top of a hill. And Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not? that it will be bitterness in the latter end? 
How long shall it be then, ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? Once they got on rising ground, they got some fresh reinforcements from the tribe of Benjamin. Abner then uh, tries to get Joab to, to stand down and uh, to stop the, the bloodletting, which could lead to just an open civil war. And so uh, Joab uh, said, As God lives, unless thou hadst spoken, surely then in the morning the people would have gone up, every one from following his brother. So Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still and pursued after Israel no more. Neither fought they. And Abner and his men walked all that night through the plain and passed over Jordan and went through all Bithron and came to Manahanaim, which is their, in effect, their capital. So Joab returned from following Abner and then he gathered all the people together. There lacked of David's servants 19 men in Asahel. But the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin and of Abner's men so that 303 score men died. So this is a, it was an inflamed skirmish, obviously substantially adverse to Abner. But uh, at the same time, it was held back from blowing up into a, a whole civil war. They took up Asahel and buried him in the sepulcher of his father, which was in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at the break of day. And that brings us to chapter 3. And as you can probably tell, see, Abner's murder of Asahel is uh, really a prelude to what some people call the long war between the two kings. We'll see that in the first verse of chapter 3. We'll see that the two remaining brothers will avenge their brother's death, much to David's grief. Now, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. So that there's very success, you know, the skirmishes back and forth, but obviously David's getting stronger and stronger. Now, unto David were sons born in Hebron. His firstborn was Ammon, Amnon of, Hin of Hinnom, the Jezreelitess. His second son, Caleb, from uh, Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And the third, Absalom, the son of Maka, the father of Talmai, the king of Geshur. And the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. And the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Apatal. And the sixth, Ithrium by Eglah, David's wife. They were born to David in Hebron. Now, it's interesting that the, uh, this last one, verse 5, some people think is a, that Eglah was another name for Michael, his first and proper wife. And though she had no family, uh, uh, and she, her, after her insolent uh, ridicule of David, which will occur in chapter 6 of 2 Samuel, uh, she, she will be uh, sort of ostracized. Many of David's wives, of course, were in direct violation of Deuteronomy 17. And uh, some students feel that this expression of David's lust eventually led to the many family problems that followed on in his later days. Amnon will violate his half-sister Tamar in chapter 13. Absalom will rebel against David and try to capture the crown in chapters 13 through 18. And Adonijah tried to wrest the kingdom from Solomon later on. So there's nothing but tension within the family for lots of different reasons. You can analyze that from several points of view. And now Abner had problems with lust also. For he took one of Saul's concubines and incurred the displeasure of the pretended king. This is going to lead to a disruption of the relationship between Abner and Ishbeth. came to pass, verse 6, that while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. But Saul had a concubine whose name was Rispa, the daughter of Ahiah. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? Now, what you have to understand, the wives and concubines of a king were considered to be property of his successor. That was the concept in those days. And for a private person to aspire to even marry one of them would be considered a virtual in advance of pretensions to the crown. This was ill-advised. Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth. He says, Am I a dog's head? Would you against Judah to show kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father and to his brethren and to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David that thou chargest me today with a fault concerning this woman? See, it's not clear whether the accusation against Abner was uh, founded or not. But he certainly, uh, he resents the charge in any case. So now he's impelled by revenge. He's going to transfer all his influence to the other side, to, to David's side. He's, or at least that's the threat. And so he's lording this over his nephew, uh, Ishbosheth. So, 
So do God to Abner and more also except as the Lord hath sworn to David, even so I do to him. To translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel, over Judah, from Dan even to Beersheba. And he could not answer Abner a word again because he feared him. Ishbosheth is now coward. He's, he's, he's intimidated by Abner. Rightly so. Ishbosheth is, uh, is, is very, very weak. So Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, Whose is the land? Saying also, Make thy league with me, and behold, my hand shall be with thee to bring about all Israel unto thee. See, David's just got Judah, and Abner's arguing that he can use his influence to deliver the rest of the nation. And he said, Well, I will make a league with thee, but one thing I require of thee, that is, thou shalt not see my face, except thou first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when thou comest to see my face. So he wants Michael back. Some of the commentators figure that he's just very devoted to that first his first wife. Uh, that's possible, but more than likely, it's probably just it's a very very shrewd political move, because Michael is Saul's daughter, and by embracing her, he reconnects himself, if you will, uh, to the followers of Saul. It's probably more not so much a lingering attachment to her as an expectation that the possession of her would incline some of the adherents to the house of Saul to be favorable to his cause. And by the way, according to the law of Deuteronomy 24, first four verses, David could not legitimately receive back his wife after her marriage to Paltiel. Remember, uh, she was given, Michael was given to another when David was as a fugitive Saul. Well, the Jewish commentators explain that David fled from Saul's home on the night of his marriage. In other words, they argue well, he really wasn't consummated because it it's a very close call there and that's the way the rabbis choose to get, out, get David out from under uh, Deuteronomy 24. But anyway, let's move on. David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Deliver me my wife Michael, which I espoused to me for an hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even from Paltiel, the son of Eliash. And her husband went with her along, weeping behind her to Baharim. Then said Abner unto him, Go, return. And he returned. So Abner had communication with the elders of Israel, saying, Ye sought for David in times past to be king over you, now then do it. For the Lord hath spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel out of the hand of the Philistines and out of the hand of all their enemies. And Abner also spake in the ears of Benjamin. Abner went also to speak in the ears of David and Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel, all that seemed good to the whole house of Benjamin. So Abner came to David, to Hebron, and twenty men with him. And David made Abner and the men that were with him a feast. So things are going along swimmingly here. Now, Abner is singing a good song here, but there's a lot of hypocrisy probably behind it. He's really uh, uh, pretending that he's prompted this whole movement by religious motives. <laughs> but it really sprang from his malice and anger and revenge against Ishbosheth is a large part of the dynamics here. And the appeal to the house of Benjamin is, is, is also important uh, because the tribe of Benjamin was the tribe from which Saul sprung. So getting their support was very politically important. And, and the, if, to the extent that the Benjamites can embrace David, the, this whole thing with Michael helps make that happen. The politics here are subtle, but I think they're pretty obvious. So uh, Abner came to David and Abron and 20 men with him. David, made, David throws a party. Abner said to David, I will arise and go and I will gather all Israel unto my lord the king, that they may make thee a league with thee, that thou mayest reign over all that thine heart desireth. And David sent Abner away and he went in peace. And behold, the servants of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away and he was gone in peace. So the, the key player is going to be here is Joab. He's the military commander for David. What Abner was to Saul, Joab is to David, in effect. When Joab and all the host that was with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king and hath sent him away and he is gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What hast thou done? Behold, Abner came unto thee. Why is it that thou hast sent him away, and he is quite gone? Thou knowest, Abner the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee, and to know thy going and out and thy coming in, and to know all that thou doest. When Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, which brought him again from the well of Sarah, but David knew it not. In other words, Abner, uh, Joab is more suspicious. Probably he, he, he I think, has a as a good measure of the craftiness of Abner. So when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside to, in the gate to speak with him quietly. 
and smote him there under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. And by the way, apparently Joab actually did it, but his brother was part of the action because there's another illusion that they're both somehow involved. Anyway, afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever from the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it rest on the head of Joab and all his father's house, and let there not fail from the house of Joab one that hath an issue, or that is a leper, or that leaneth on a staff, or that falleth on a sword, or that lacketh bread. And Joab and Abishai, his brothers, slew Abner because he had slain their brother Asahel at Gibeon in the battle. Now you can say, gee, isn't Joab, isn't he a... Uh, Avenger of blood. He's not entitled to be a Goel, uh, avenger of blood, or a, a kinsman redeemer, because it's a city of Re Hebron is a city of refuge. So that doesn't come up here, but that's some of the background there. There are all kinds of reasons why Joab, by the way, uh, had private and well as personal reasons here. He obviously uh, was concerned about the uh, reception given to Abner. He was concerned about the military talents of Abner. They were well proven. His popularity with the army and his influence throughout the nation. That makes Abner a very formidable rival for Joab in the event that Abner's overtures really bring this all together under David, that then David's going to owe Abner a great deal of loyalty and gratitude. And that accession would be a serious obstacle to the ambitions of Joab. And of course, add, add to all this that you've got a blood feud between them anyway because Abner murdered his brother, Asahel. While Joab actually did the killing, Abishai's brother was probably was apparently in on the plans also. And by the way, Joab's hands will continue to be stained with blood. through the Because uh, he not only killed Abner, he also is going to end up killing Absalom in 2 Samuel 18 and Amasa in 2 Samuel 20. And it's really Joab that's going to engineer for David the murder of Uriah. And all that comes up, so... That's, uh, he's, he's sort of his secretary of defense or commander of the army or however you want to put it. David said to Job and all the people that were with him, rend your clothes and gird you with sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And the king David himself followed the bier. And what the bier is, of course, sort of a wooden frame, sort of resembling a, somewhere a cross between a wheelbarrow and a coffin. The hand barrow, in other words. And they buried Abner in Hebron. How ironic that Abner was killed in a, house, in a city of refuge. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth? Thy hands were not bound, thy feet put into fetters. As a man falleth before wicked men, so fellest thou. And all the people wept again over him. And all the people came to cause David to eat meat while it was yet day. David swore, saying, So God do to me, and more also if I taste bread or aught else until the sun go down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them. Whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people and all the Israel understood that day it was not of the king to slay Abner, the son of Ner. So on the one hand, you see David's heart here. He's grieved over the violence, but so conspicuously genuine that it also exonerates him from the death of Abner. Now, I might mention Joab is going to have blood on his hands, as I mentioned, all these others, but it, it, and that's going to endure as David is dying and passing the crown to Solomon, he gives him a number of errands to clean up, and one of which is to do something about Joab. And Solomon deals with Joab. As after David dies, he will deal with Joab. So Joab is sort of the hatchet man. He's the guy that's uh, doing all the the, uh, the dirty work behind the scenes here, but he ultimately gets his too. So it's a, it's a whole violent dynamic going on here. The king said unto the service, Know ye not that there was a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel? And I am this day weak, though anointed king, and these men were the sons of Zariah. Be too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. This is too hard. In other words, David can't deal with, with Joab. You would think that in his heart of hearts, he knows there has to be something. You know, it's, it's a complicated thing. There's, there's arguments both sides. So, he said, it's, here's David. He's organized 600 warriors or malcontents. He dealt harshly with the Amalekites back there in 2 Samuel 1. He put to death the men who murdered Ishbosheth, but he can't handle Job's misdeeds. Joab, I should say, his misdeeds. And uh, so he washed his hands and left Joab to the judgment of God. 
and God will do that. He will, in, in, in 1 Kings 2, he's going to instruct Solomon to clean up the loose ends <laughs> with regard to Joab. One short chapter, and we've got a good start here. We've got one more murder to get through, and that's this would-be king. <laughs> when Saul's son heard, Saul's son of Ishbosheth, heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. Boy, I can imagine. He was weak to begin with. And when his, his power was, was uh, lost by Abner being killed, he is in big trouble. And he knows it. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of the bands. The name of one was Banna, and the name of the other, Rechab, the sons of Remon the uh, Berathite, of the children of Benjamin, for Beeroth was also reckoned with Benjamin. So these are all Benjamites. They're, they're of the house that's where Saul came from, and that's where Ishbosheth's, uh, that's his identity with it. And um, the Berathites fled to Gatim, which are sojourners until this day, and I won't get into all the geography. It's not that critical. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's about nine miles from Jerusalem on the road leading to the north. There's another verse in here that I give you more picture. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son, in other words, a grandson of Saul, that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. It came to pass that as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name is called Mephibosheth. There's a little more background here. Mephibosheth is regarded as being unfit for any official duties because he's lame. That was part of the concept. He was only five years old when his father and his grandfather were both killed at Gilboa. And uh, his nurse, hearing of the Philistines' victory, was apprehensive, and in pursuit of it, they would immediately send a party to Saul's house to cut off um, all that pertained to the throne, especially the young masters, who was now next heir to the crown. So the nurses panicked because with, with the father and grandfather killed, he's a target, of course, and he's still only five. So she flees with the child in her arms, probably to secure it in some secret place where he wouldn't be found or some strong place where he couldn't be got at, gotten at. But she fell with the child, and by the fall, somehow a bone was broken or somehow the child became lame, and from that point on was unfit. So he's no longer a threat, but he's still around. David is going to take him under wing, and because of his love of Jonathan, he's going to ultimately give Meshavah theft very specially. Anyway, picking up, the, that was an insertion. The sons of Rimon, the Berathite, and Rechab and Minah, they went and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who lay on a bed at noon. Well, this is somehow descriptive um, of the guy. He should be with his troops or something. Anyway, and they came thither into the midst of the house as though they would have fetched wheat. You have to understand that these were the two uh, leaders then for the, for the military, and part of the pay was food. That was very common. And so they would they came there, presumably in, in anticipation of the next day, having to have payroll, if you will, food for the troops. And that was their pretense of getting access. They would have fetched wheat. Somehow the, the security situation for the wheat and for the king were in the same compound. They got in for the wheat, but they went and they smote him, that is the king, under the fifth rib, and Rechab and Benah, his brother, escaped. So they, they nailed him. See, the ruse, they, it's sort of like the ruse of you know, a delivery man trying to get access. The Septuagint has a different rendering here. It would read, And behold, the woman who kept the door of the house was winnowing wheat, and as she slumbered and slept, the brothers Rechab and Benek escaped. Notice. So that, that adds a detail in the Septuagint that implies how they got in. But in any case, when they came into the house, they lay on his bed in the bedchamber. They smote him and slew him and beheaded him and took his head and got them away through the plain all night. The plain, the way that's translated, through the valley of the uh, valley of the Jordan, and uh, which was on their way to their capital city. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David in Hebron. Here again, they're misjudging David. They assume they're getting rewarded for having dealt with his enemy, because see, Ishbosheth was a was a rival, right? They brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron and said to the king, Behold, the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life. And the Lord hath avenged my lord, the king, this day of Saul and of his seed. Well, David answered Rechab and Bena, his brother, the sons of Rimmon, the Bethrite, and said to them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity, 
When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag, who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. How much more when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed? Shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? Hey, there's drama here. Can you, get, can you see the look on their face? Man. David commanded his young men and they slew him, cut off their hands and their feet because they were the instruments of the sin, and hanged them up over the pool of Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulcher of Abner in Hebron. So ends our little excursion of the first four chapters, pretty bloody. These are the chapters of intrigue. In chapter 5, next time, we're going to see David crowned, not just of Judah, but of the whole nation. And to, from chapters 5 through 10, we're going to experience his prosperity. We're going to see how the kingdom grows. He's, going to, he's, a, he's a marvelous general, and he's a very, very shrewd, sharp king. He's very human. He's going to end up, after the 10th chapter, he's going to get into all kinds of trouble. Rather predictably, you all know the story. But uh, we're going to experience the next uh, uh, six chapters, chapters 5 through 10, uh, hit the prosperity of David's early court and his, and his campaigns. And we'll, do, we'll have maps and all that and give you a feeling for this incredible king. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Our first glimpses of David, very complex guy, brilliant general, really developed his leadership skills while as fugitive with his loyal band. But he rises to kingship very alertly. He judges the politics very shrewdly. He uh, deals with the, uh, in a very unpredictable way with these people that thought that he could be bribed, so to speak. Quite the contrary. He's a man's man, and yet he's also a poet. He's a very complex, fascinating being. One of our goals as we go through the second Samuel is to try to understand this uh, complicated guy. He's the only guy of which the scripture says he's a man after God's own heart. That doesn't mean he's perfect. He makes some serious mistakes, but he repents of them. And we'll study that each of those things as they come. But his first exposures here, very strong, morally, very strong uh, leadership, generalship, and so forth. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for David. We thank you, Father, that for our Messiah, who is known as the Son of David. We do pray, Father, through your Spirit, through your Word, you'd help us understand this man. Help us to grasp his strengths, his weaknesses, his responses, his appropriate ones, his inappropriate ones. We would seek to learn, Father, through your Holy Spirit, that in all these things we might grow in grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and also, Father, that we might more fully comprehend the relationship between David and our King, our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen.